creating a school that is more inclusive and more sustainable for the long term. Designing a new state-of-the-art facility for a combined Shaw-Taylor school will open doors not only for Shaw-Taylor students and families, but for the entire Southern Dorchester and Mattapan community. Next slide. Want to orient schools in the Southern Dorchester and Mattapan area. Here you'll see that the Shaw and Taylor are close to one another, about 0 0.6 mile away from each other. Circle you see in between the Shaw and the Taylor is Benka, which serves high school students. Darker shades of blue represents a higher level of new of need according to the B BPS building needs map. The building dashboard assigns a score to each BPS facility. That number is a, com is a composite score that takes into account facility needs as well as student needs represented by the Student Opportunity Index. The light blue circle you see at the bottom is the Mildred Ave, K through eight, the newest school in the neighborhood. The other light blue circle you see that at the near the top is the Roxbury Prep Lucy Stone School, which is BPS owned, but leased out to Roxbury Prep. As you can see, the Shaw and the Taylor are not the only schools in the neighborhood with a high building needs score. I'll walk you through the data on the next slide. Here you see the Shaw and Taylor compared to some of the other elementary schools in the area. We excluded K through eight schools, as well as the Henderson upper and lower schools, which have a specialized program. The Shaw Taylor merge, merger would combine a small, nearly single strand school, the Shaw with a larger school, the Taylor. The Shaw and the Taylor building needs scores places them in the fifth and fourth quint quintile respectively to all BPS facilities. Next slide. Here you'll see, here you'll see which of these schools are inclusion schools and which have multilingual programming. In part because it, it is so small, the Shaw is not considered an inclusive school. It has only general education classrooms. The Shaw Taylor merger would combine a small single strand school with a larger, more inclusive school. As you can see here, the Taylor has an inclusion strand as well as a sub separate programming. And it also has multilingual programming, including a Haitian Creole sheltered English immersion program and a multilingual SLIFE program or students with limited or interrupted formal education. The Taylor is the only school in the area that is both inclusive and has a variety of programs for English learners. Next slide. Here you'll see that many of the schools in the neighborhood lack some of the kinds of spaces that we want all elementary schools to have. Neither the Shore nor the Taylor has a standalone auditorium or cafeterium, gym or science lab, and the Taylor lacks a dedicated library space. Combining the two schools will allow us to consolidate some classrooms, freeing up physical space to support enrichment programming. Longer term designing a new facility for the combined Shaw Taylor schools will ensure that these students have access to state of the art spaces, libraries, science lab, auditoriums, and gym as a baseline. 
with an opportunity to, des to design for other special programs, before and after school programming, community gathering spaces, and other types of spaces, depending on what the community chooses through the design process. Next slide. On this side, you'll see two different timelines. On the left, you'll see the steps for the MSBA submission. And on the right, you'll see the steps for the proposed Shaw-Taylor merger. I want to take a quick minute to explain what these two timelines mean. Based on the MSBA guidelines, we will submit two different SOIs independently of one another. The Shaw SOI will be this year's primary submission and the Taylor would be secondary. The narrative in each application explained that our proposal is to build one, one new facility for the combined Shaw-Taylor School, pending school committee approval. The deadline to submit the SOIs is April 14th. Based on the timeline we sketched out with the Shaw-Taylor design team, I plan to come back before this body in late April to present our merger proposal before asking for your vote in May. As I ask for your vote to approve these statements of interest, I want to be clear. This is not a vote to approve the merger since we are submitting two different SOIs. These applications are independent of the merger vote. We expect the MSBA to notify us of their decision by the end of 2023. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Brian McLaughlin, project manager for the City of Boston Public Facilities Department to explain the MSBA timeline in a little more detail. Brian. Thank you, Del. Thank you, Del. Uh, good evening, committee members. As Dell mentioned, the statements of interest are due to the MSBA on April 14th. After this deadline, the MSBA will begin their review process of all SOIs submitted by districts throughout the Commonwealth. This review will likely include site visits to the facilities that submitted SOIs in the spring or summer of 2023. The initial invite by the MSBA will likely occur, likely occur at their October or December 2023 board meetings. This initial invitation is called the eligibility period. This is a nine month period uh, where districts are required to complete certain prerequisite action items to show the MSBA they are ready to take on a large project. These action items include agreeing to the enrollment of a newly constructed school, updating a district's maintenance practices with the MSBA, answering the MSBA educational profile questionnaire and appropriating funds to support the design of, this, of a future project. Upon completion of the eligibility period, which will likely take place in the fall of 2024, the MSBA will then invite districts to conduct a feasibility study. With the invite of the feasibility study by the MSBA board, districts then bring on a consultant team which usually takes between four and six months. With consultants on board in late 2024, early 2025, design will commence. This will likely be a two year process based upon the MSBA program check-ins during design with construction likely starting in 2027. Anticipated construction duration for a project of this size is likely two to three years with the potential school opening for 2029 or 2030. Thank you, Del. Thanks, Brian. I also just want to take a moment to address some of the feedback we heard during public comment tonight, specifically around the merger of the Sumner and Philbrick and the renovation of the Irving Building. I'm committed to working closely with our school communities throughout all of our capital projects, and particularly ensuring that our historically marginalized voices are at the table. 
I appreciate the families who have been engaged in this process. It is true that the design of the urban renovation was already on the way by the time BPS proposed that the Sumner and Philbrick merge into the new facility. So these communities were not at the table from the very beginning. Over the, over the last several months, my team has been working hard to bring Sumner and Philbrick families, educators and some leaders and school leaders into the process. In fact, they were walking the Irving building earlier tonight with representatives of both schools, of both schools, the public facilities department and the architects and landscape architects the city has hired for this project. I'm really grateful to our city partners for working so closely with the school communities, even when it means readjusting plans as we go. This is shaping up to be a beautiful state of the art facility. It's exciting to get a clear picture of what this means for our students. And it's even more exciting that through this proposal tonight for a new facility for the Shaw and Taylor through the MSBA and through the Green New Deal for BPS over time. We'll be bringing that school experience to all Boston's young people. With that, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Stanislaus, and thank you to your entire team for their work on this exciting project, which our students and families so greatly deserve. I'll now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. Mr. Cardet Hernandez. I'll go first. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I'm gonna to try to be brief because it's late and I'm fading. But um, the first question I have less about this, but what happens now to the horse man school for the deaf? I believe that was the last uh, mm -hmm. one that we didn't get, MSBA project that we didn't get. So I'm just sort of curious, what's the state of play there? Uh, thank you for that question. So what's happening to the Horace Mann School right now? Currently happening? Yeah, for their, like, is there a plan for them to get a new building since we didn't get approved for MSBA funding for that new building and what? Sort of okay. what it's um, just it seems hard to talk about what's next without talking about yep. where we are after. Yeah. Yep. Del yeah, I, Del I just just a thought, but I think it would also be good to tag Talion just because some of this predates you. Um, so I, I think feel free to um, tag Talion as well. Yeah, I think I'm fine with the um, the question on what's happening to the Horace Man. So um, we're currently renovating the Edwards building to serve as swing space for the Horace Man. Um, and we're committed uh, through the Green New Deal and the like, our current, like the process, our current process. So if we're committed to um, doing an analysis of the current Jackson Man site, as well as um, other sites in the Austin, Brighton, um, and throughout Boston to find a permanent home for the Horace Man School. Copy. One more question. And I'm just sort of, I'm trying to just make sense just so I understand the timeline too. So if everything goes, as planned, just ride this wave with me. And I know we're no commitments because there's no vote, but just sort of if the timeline rolls as you would like, this merger would happen between the two schools and then they would be in that merger space, whatever it is, maybe even a split site, like an upper and a lower, we don't know, right? But they would be in that merger for about five years till this building is built? Or is it longer? Like how long does this project normally take to finalize? So, uh, Del, if you, I can speak to that if you're all right with that. Yeah, so if the, um, based upon the MSBA, um, their usual timeline upon acceptance of uh, the statement of interest application in 2023, you'd likely see a new building open in 2029 or 2030. That's helpful. And then real question, what does the city have any sort of plan for what we would do with the existing buildings? Um, 
It's a good question. So uh, currently we're going through the facilities condition assessment plan and also um, the design uh, process through DLR. Um, I think those two process combining that with the long-term uh, facilities master plan. Um, once we have those documents in hand and all of our buildings um, are rated based on um, needs, et cetera, we'll be able to develop like a full comprehensive plan, strategic plan, like to, to operationalize what comes out of the facilities condition assessment plan and the design study to figure out like, what are we doing? How are we using like all of the buildings, the empty buildings across the district? Are we using them as swing space um, while we renovate, do rebuilds for other schools? Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and again, I will also um, try to keep it Short, uh, two quick questions and, and following up, and thank you, Mr. Cardet Hernandez for bringing up about the Horace Man, because you're absolutely right. If, you know, here we had one, we had one community get excited, right, about a proposal moving forward. It didn't get approved. And then uh, it sounds like we're moving on to another one. And those families are gonna say, whoa, what, what, what about us? And there is precedent of that. The, the MSBA turned down the Carter School the first time that went to the MSBA. And then I think their eyes were opened about the special needs of that community and of that, of that is served by the Carter School. And with their help, we actually redid the proposal from what was gonna be a minor renovation to in fact, a brand new building doubling the size and MSBA got very enthusiastic about it. And I think we can continue to do education with MSBA, I would hope, and, and Mr. McLaughlin, I'm gonna look for you for guidance on this because no one is more of an expert of MSBA than you, including having worked there. I would hope that we could continue to do some education with MSBA about the population that the Horace Man serves. Um, I'm a big fan of their work there. I also, and I look forward to welcoming them to Charlestown about a hundred yards from where, I'm, where I live right now, they're gonna be almost next door neighbors and I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I know a, the key thing for them is gonna be a permanent solution. And, you know, I hope, now this will not be popular with some of the Horace Mann teachers or families who love being in Brighton and are used to it and it's close commute for them. I personally feel that Horace Mann is a school that serves all of our city's children, just as the Carter School does and would be a great opportunity for them to be somewhere centrally located in the city. So if you're in Hyde Park or you're in East Boston or so on and so forth, it can be a bit of a commute to Brighton. And it may make sense to also consider a central location like we have for the Carter School. So that's, I'll get off the soapbox on that. I But Mr. McLaughlin, I have two questions for you. One, is there a possibility with Horace Mann to rethink how we did the application with uh, MSBA and could we go back to them, do some further education, revise it? Feedback I had heard was we did not, and, and this may be more about Blackstone, which I think is gonna be handled. Hopefully we'll find other funds for that. But you know, we get feedback that we didn't elevate it to the concern level for MSBA. And so what is the, I don't wanna over hype opportunities for the Shaw Taylor families. You know, what is your sense of receptivity by MSBA to this request and how can we position it in the best way forward? I agree with what Ms. Stanislaw said about this is a community that, you know, we have not made a lot of investments in and that is wrong. And this is an opportunity to help write that. It is a neighborhood, as Ms. Stanislaw pointed out, that has a growing elementary school population. So we need to be investing there. But how do you know how do we position this for the best success possible with Ms. McLaughlin with the MSBA? And then it's not a sense of we're just putting an application in to put an application in. Sure. I think um, with both the the Blackstone and the Horace Man, um, both applications which have been um, not moved forward by the MSBA, both buildings present, <laughs> I wouldn't say challenges, but they both have spaces 
that are outside of MSBA involvement, uh, specifically with community centers and health centers. So um, if we're looking at those buildings as a whole, they it's not they don't it's not precluded from moving forward with the MSBA, but they may not be the right fit to participate with the MSBA on a collaborative project because at the end of the day, some of this a lot of the space that will be in a, a new future building for the Blackstone or the Horace Mann may not be reimbursable by the MSBA due to the fact that it's outside of educational use. Um, that being said, with the Shaw Taylor, looking at both, walking both those schools and seeing the educational spaces that are, that are in both those facilities, um, spaces in the basement, the lack of PE space, the, there's no library at the Shaw, um, they're, they're older buildings where a lot of the systems are reaching the end of the useful life. And I think both facilities are prohibiting the district from delivering the desired educational program, which is a big, big thing that the MSBA looks at when factoring in which, which facilities are going to move forward. So based upon the, the ability to present within the SOI issues at both these facilities, I think the MSBA will, will, will review and likely visit these schools to get a better understanding of how difficult it is to, to provide, um, again, the, the educational needs of the, of the students in both buildings. So I feel um, personally, and I think others share that, the, the shot Taylor applications, are more in line with the MSBA program than maybe the Jackson Man or the Blackstone. Thank you. That's really helpful to hear that distinction. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to jump in um, on Brian's uh, answer. Um, just to add a little bit more context. So part of developing the long-term plan is about figuring out which projects are good, like Brian shared candidates for the MSBA and which um, we should move forward on alone as like a city and a district. In order to move faster, we know there's a lot of um, need across the district. So we just have to be thoughtful about what we're, um, what we're sequencing these projects to move quickly while still leveraging the MSBA partnership. Um, I was lucky, I think it was two weeks ago to visit the Horace Mann School. Um, been in consultation with the school leader. They're an incredible community and we're committed to building um, out the Edwards building and also securing um, a long-term home that's designed for their community. Um, you're right that the Horace Mann School serves children, not only from across uh, the city of Boston, but also students um, outside of the district. We're looking at all options, both in Austin, Brighton, and across the city to find um, like a long-term home for the Horace Mann community. Um, and I think that I also wanted to share that um, we submitted, as pointed out, the Blackstone um, last year, um, and we're absolutely committed to those projects. We're grateful to our city partners for their support and partnership as we ramp up the pace of construction and the number of projects in the pipeline. Um, being totally honest, we can't do every project all at the same time. So we have to think carefully. We have to continue to think carefully about timelines and sequencing, but I'm looking forward to coming back to the school committee later this spring to talk um, more about our overall capital proposal in more detail. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Ms. Polanco Garcia. Thanks, uh, Madam. Muchas um, gracias. Thank you. I say thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, you for the presentation. <laughs> I know it's eleven fifteen. I know. <laughs> mi, mi pregunta va a ser muy rápida. <laughs> Esto de la fusión no tan solo va a impactar, no tan solo va a impactar a las familias, sino también a los maestros. Um, this um, fusion is not only going to impact um, teachers, sino también a lo, a, a impactar a las familias y a los maestros. And only it, it, it will also affect um, 
the families and teachers. Entonces, yo sé que las dos escuelas tienen planes de estudios diferentes. And I know that both schools have different, um, different plans. ¿Qué, ¿Qué plan tiene el distrito con, esta, con esto? Porque al tener planes de estudios diferentes va a impactar necesariamente a los educadores. So what plan does the district have? Because them having different educational plans um, that will affect the educators. Hi, everyone. Oh, sorry, Dal, were you? Hey, I can, you can uh, go ahead, Rebecca. Um, jumping in here, um, I've been working closely with the capital planning team um, and uh, just wanted to speak a bit to the, the different programming. You know, part of what we've been thinking about through the design team process is how do we bring together two school communities that um, have many shared values, but also have some differences, um, including some of their school programming. One of the benefits to bringing these two communities together is that the Shaw community actually has a much lower threshold for programming because of the size of their school. And so combining them into, um, into one joined community actually allows us to be thoughtful about the combined programming as well. Um, and as uh, Del was saying earlier, you know, the um, Taylor has both um, inclusion, um, they also have um, um, multilingual programs, um, and the size of their community allows them to have increased programming. So we can be, uh, through this design process, we can be really intentional about examining what are the assets of both, um, of all the strands in both schools, and then being thoughtful about how we then bring them together and support um, the kids and potentially also what uh, programming is built out and added um, as we identify needs. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Um, as Rebecca just uh, really demonstrated, combining schools isn't just um, a facilities decision, right? Um, it really impacts all layers of school and it's of the school community and its program. Um, so we're being, a, so we're being, um, bringing, sorry, we're bringing a whole uh, team to work with the school communities to make sure we're designing the merger thoughtfully. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, when the Mildred Avenue School was built, were there other schools that were sh shut down or merged to become Mildred Avenue, or how did they get their student body? Does anybody know? No. Sorry, um, I don't know, but I can um, I can find out. Yeah. Sure, and yeah. come back to you with that chair. Yeah. No, I was just wondering what our, our process has been in the past when a new school is built, if it wasn't built for a specific um, community. Um, so that'll be, that'll be interesting. Um, that's the only question that I have for this evening. I understand the process. I just wanna make sure if anybody else has any other um, questions that they wanna ask before we move on. If no, I guess we will take this up at our next meeting. And um, is there any new, oh, is there any public comment on reports, Ms. Sullivan? No, Chair, no public comment on reports. Um, any new business? I know Dr. Alkins has left, but the only thing that I, I, I wanted to ask superintendent that the recommendation that Dr. Alkins had made about having uh, an additional column around the um, the grants in terms of giving us uh, an update on any grant that's being um, moving forward or increased would be helpful. And if we could have that in place for the next 
time we're looking at grants. Yes, Chair. Uh, I think uh, we'll make sure that that happens. I think also uh, post the budget, once the budget team is uh, freed up a little bit, we'll go back in retrospect to last year and grants that were approved last year and fold those into the cadence. Great. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. right. Well, that concludes our business for the evening. Um, our next virtual school committee meeting will take place next Wednesday on March 22nd at 5 p.m., at which time the committee will vote on the superintendent's revised fiscal year 24 budget recommendation. If there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Mr. Credit Hernandez? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes, de buenas noches. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Thank you. It's unanimous. Thank you. Um, and have a good night. See you next week. Good night, everyone. Good night.